All right, our last presentation is from Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, as I understand it, I'm the only thing standing between you and happy hour, so I'll try to make this as, uh, <laughs> as painless as possible. And uh, actually, I wish I was not the last one. The, the concluding remarks we just had were great. I mean, this, the, I think the, the contractor's point of view on this is, 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 a, is all we need to hear today about these, these control systems. I'll just try to add a little bit on it. So my name is Marc Jolin. I'm not Melody. Those of you who know Melody will realize that. Uh, I'm, I'm a supervisor. Uh, she, uh, she recently finished her master's, actually last week. She uh, handed in her last version of everything, so she's working and I could not be here. So I'll try to do my best. So everything good in there is her fault. Everything bad is probably mine. And we'll try to go through this. A quick summary. We'll, we'll, we'll see this. I want to put you in context and full disclosure. This is a research pro project we have with, uh, with, with Command Alcon, Denis Beaupré here, and Beton Provincial, a local concrete producer. And it's something that goes under the, uh, with NSERC, the National Research Council uh, here in Canada. It's a great system for those of you doing research outside of Canada. If you find a dollar in the industry, the federal government is going to match it. So it's a very, very interesting way of doing research. Not only because of the money aspect, obviously, but because you get students and grad students end up having a foot in research and a foot in reality and having to, to deal with both of, it, both of these aspects at the same time. So it's quite exciting to be able to work uh, in, in projects like that. We have enough means and enough interest from the industry to, to run them. So, and you get the title there just to give you the idea. So the context, and, and I think it was, it was clearly said, there's, there's obviously a crisis of sustainable development uh, around the planet. I mean, nobody's going to argue about that. And unfortunately, concrete, if you look at what's been done in other industries, automotive, airplane, anything, in the general production industry, they have been very, very efficient over the last 100 years in improving their process. When you think about it, the way we still do concrete, and taking those probes out of the picture right now, and, and, and the, the measuring systems, it's, it's roughly the same. We've, we've been doing the same way for hundreds of years. Yes, we've had great improvements with plasticizers, all kinds of admixtures, mixing and things, but we're still doing the exact same thing, more or less. So I think that there's a need there to try to improve what we're doing. And, and what Denny was talking about, the black hole, is really something that's, that I think is hurting a lot of people in the industry. Uh, and that's, that's the plant to site. I think there's a lot to do with that on the plant to site aspect. We need to look more into it. And I, I feel for concrete producers. I mean, they, you try to guesstimate as well as you can what's going to leave the plant. And as, as you said a little bit earlier, once it's off the chute, it's not yours anymore. And God knows they're going to do a lot of stupid things with it sometimes. And, and be able to teach, learn, have a good idea what's going on. At least at, nowadays, it's when it leaves the plant. If we can go at, as far as when it leaves the chute, we're already a lot better than what we were, uh, we were just a few years ago. And that, that's really the point I want to insist on. So, uh, of course, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I mean, there's a lot we can do about the social, economic, and the environment aspect. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you a few numbers we, we played with, uh, especially on the environmental aspect. And it's quite impressive what we, what we can do. Uh, the solution, well, Denny showed this. So it's, we're, we're working with uh, Command Alcon's probe on our, in our trucks. Well, our trucks, in the trucks we, that have been equipped. Uh, Denny showed that pretty quickly. So it's the probe the shoulder panel, the display, and everything goes back in real time to the, uh, to the database. And that's really interesting for us in research because we managed to get a lot of information. What I, what I prefer, though, is the fact that, and that's looking further in time, is that you have a fleet of trucks that are all hooked back to the database at the concrete plant. And what really gives you the option to do is do real-time monitoring. Yes, that's good. But then you can act on it. And you can actually act on it pretty quickly. Uh, we heard about it. First truck leaves. It's not even on the job site yet. You can probably change what you're going to do for the second truck, giving temperature. Maybe it rained all night. Maybe there's more traffic than expected. You can act very, very quickly. And one truck saved, not turning around, is just making mo enough money for that day. I mean, you, you need to keep those, those, those rejected trucks as, to a low, as, as low as possible, and hopefully none over the day. So quick action is important. But also, and we've seen everybody said the same thing, this got, they got tons of data right now. They got a lot of data, da data in the database. There's a lot of action and analysis we can run on these, these numbers to see what we're doing. And that, from what we've seen today, I think we've only scratched the surface of what we can do if we start digging even more in, the, in all that the data, especially when it comes to training and helping the, uh, helping the guys do their job better. Uh, so the goal of the CRD project, the whole thing, is to analyze 
optimize and develop the capabilities of the probe system. So we're really, I mean, it's, like I said, full disclosure, we're working with the probe system, trying to make it better, trying to go further, see what we can pull out of those database, and try to go a little bit, a little bit further with it. And on this specific project, uh, Milady was working on looking at economy, uh, you know, environmental impact and dollar impact, see how we can improve and see what kind of improvements we can find in there. I mean, how many, how much dollars are we saving? How much, uh, how much time are we really saving? So we only started it. This is only the beginning of it. And I'll, I'll show you a few things here. So, of course, the idea here is to, whoop, color is bizarre, but, you know, where and when try to have a uh, play with the history of the delivery there. Uh, understand the performance of the mix. I'm talking, of course, fresh state performance. How does it get to the plant? How does it change? What's going on? What's happening on the road? And, and then driver action. That's, I knew it was a big thing, but hearing today the two contractors talking, it's even worse than I expected. So we'll have to, we'll have to look into this as well. And of course, the idea is to see what we can gain in terms of money, uh, see how marketing-wise satisfaction, client relationship, uh, that's important. And then, of course, reduce the impact of concrete production all around. Uh, let's look uh, a little bit about how we did it in terms of, um, of monitoring the, what's going on. So the, the advantage of having this, this, this probe system is that the, the whole, you have in your database a whole bunch of different states. You know where the truck is and what the truck is doing. So when you, you start looking at the database, you know where it was at the plant, loading, unloading, traveling around, uh, at the, 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 the water, uh, water addition. You, you have a whole complete picture. For us, what we looked into for, for, for a beginning in a database of, of information we had over a year uh, long of, of data collection is loading time, unloading time, of course, at the plant and the job site. We looked at waiting time at the plant and also waiting time at the job site. And these are the four aspects we wanted to look at. And just for, just for melodies, oh, I'll, I'll, see, I'll show you later. So what we had is uh, four sets of data. So April 9, 2017, we have 25 trucks without the probe, and the year a year later, they all have probes in it. So we have 25 trucks with probes or without probes. And throughout the year, a whole bunch of trucks remained without probes, and anywhere between 17 and 25 trucks were without probes in the data I'm going to show you. So the idea, obviously, is to compare what happens when you add the probe. Can, are you doing a better job when you have information? And of course, we compare it to the uh, reference case where we have absolutely no information, and they kept doing what they were doing. Uh, the idea here is that you end up with a lot of data. You guys have seen it. Then you have, to, you have to make a selection. So the initial selection was to take, well, the first five trucks of the day uh, that had a minimum of eight yards in it and uh, work on the, to verify repeatability. No, let me do that again. Repeatability. Uh, we did average over a month, and then we took one random day out of everything and just compared it to see if one day is comparable to the rest. And uh, to Melody's uh, credit, there's a lot of data. Seriously, we are filling hard drives of data. And uh, I don't have, you remember last time you worked in Excel with minutes and seconds, how much fun it is to add and subtract time stuff? Just <laughs> anybody's having fun thinking about it? It's, it's a nightmare. Seriously, it's not easy to start digging into those data. So you have Excel has its limit. You have to start digging with other tools. And, and, and we're even talking about, you know, who, who could help us doing better data analysis, better data digging, and what, is, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense? It's not just by drafting X, Y graphics that you do get the information. You have to go a little bit deeper, just, just for the fun. So, I mean, no, no big surprise here. Uh, the results we saw was loading time at the plant, not much change. And if you look at the, the data down there, we have the trucks with and without probes. Uh, in 2017, 2018, and there's a whole statistical you know, analysis to do that, see if the differences we see are or not uh, significant. So loading time at the plant, the, the, the result is, well, it's not significant. Waiting time at the plant, not significant. We see that things change a little bit between, the, between 2017, 2018, but they change for both type of trucks, or with or without the probe. Uh, oop, I had a little bit more coming, sorry. Uh, the other one is unloading time at the job site. Seems that 2018 was a lot faster for everybody at that, at that uh, concrete plant, so not much of a change there. Of course, where it was really a change and a significant change is the waiting time at the job site. The idea here is that if the technician has confidence into the slump he reads on the, on the, on the, on the screen, 
he's not going to test the truck. He's going to use it right away. And of course, they don't end up testing or not testing every truck. But once, once they got the confidence going, they can deal with it and they can go forward with it. And that was a huge difference for us when we started looking at statistical distribution around this. And the waiting time at job site, just a single topic, this is the one we looked at just to have an idea how much money this may represent. And when you look at the money that represents, th th this is the average. So the, the gain in delivery time was, uh, well, at, at, at the job site is five minutes in average, five minutes, 41 seconds. And you see the minimum and maximum because we work with standard deviation on both sides just to get an idea. At $1.40 cents a minute, and I didn't come up with this, we asked around, that's the number we were given. A truck is $1.40 a, min uh, um, a minute, that's roughly what it is. More than that, I'll be happy. Uh, we'll, we'll crank up the numbers, I only look better. So we're looking at $7.95 uh, per load, and then let's go, let's go, oops, everything is offset here. Let's go for 100 deliveries a day. The plant we work with was running 230 30, uh, 30 days of, of working days in the, given there was a couple of winter days where I didn't do, didn't do a lot of deliveries. I'm sorry about this, but we're looking at for one concrete plant, roughly $183,000 a year. How many plants did you have? You said 20 something, 30 something, 40 plants? I mean, then you start multiplying by the number of trucks, the number of plants, the economy there is in millions of dollars. So I don't think it's a big discussion. And what we heard today is, 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 is a good testimony to that, that it's, it's a great investment. Uh, well, it depends how much it costs, but from what we know, it's a great investment. And if you want to leave here with just a, a, a rough number, it's a dollar a yard. So you can multiply, $7.95, seven we had uh, trucks between, uh, well, uh, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, nine yards, so that's roughly a dollar a yard, just to, to, to fix the number. So you know how many yards you're producing, you know how many yards you're buying, you're selling, you're specifying. There's, this, this is the big number right there. So that was very interesting. The next step is to dig a little bit deeper in those data, see what we can do and see how, and there's no, don't, not much training yet that was done with this. So we need to see how far we can go and from what I heard here today, we can go a lot further. If we look quickly at the environmental aspect, uh, we used uh, the uh, environmental product declaration sheet. You guys have seen that before. It's a very long document. It has lots of numbers in there on all kinds of, of aspects of environmental impact. It, it, it measures everything, transport, water, all kinds of things. So we decided to just extract a few things in there. And in here, here's the hypothesis. So we're, and I'm, I'm MPA, I'm sorry about that, but I mean, if, if you're, they ask you for 30 MPA concrete on the job site, so close to 4,000 PSI. Uh, of course, we have to over-engineer, and I love this, the, the idea of the over-engineering part. Uh, in the Canadian standard, we have to be as, as high as eight, eight and a half MPAs above it. So for the sake of using the tables we had, we say, let's say, instead, if you want to deliver a 30 MPA, you're gunning for 40 MPA. That's what you need to be able to deliver, given that we don't know what they're going to do with it after it hits the chute. So the hypothesis here is that, well, if we don't, if we want to optimize something, we'll have to control it. If we want to control it, we got to measure it. So the probe is there to help measure. And by the way, let me be clear, we did not run anything with the probe on this. I'm just saying maybe the probe can help us do a better job. The whole monitoring, <coughs> monitoring system can help us do a better job. So maybe instead of going for 40 MPA, we have enough information so we do not over-engineer that mix up to 40. We only over-engineer it up to 35 MPA. And that's something we've heard today. Now my question is, what's the impact from an environmental point of view? So we went into, I'm sorry, those squares are, you love PowerPoint. Uh, we went into the uh, declaration uh, product sheet. We took three mixes at 30 MPA, right there. Uh, so, the, sorry, three mixes at 40 MPA and the same three companion mixtures at 35 MPA. Uh, no, no, fly, no, no fly ash, no slag, with or without air. And we just picked up a few just to have companions, six different uh, mix design here. And when you, when you look, well, of course, we went back to this, extract the numbers. Now, the question in, when, when you're talking about this is always that which one are we going to take up there? There's a lot of indicator of what's an environmental impact. And we went through a whole bunch of, I mean, looked at which one are which and what could we use so that you got the most significant on climate change, the most significant on ecosystem quality, most significant on human health. Uh, these are, well, usually people take three or five or nine or the whole thing. Uh, these are the ones we decided to use. So global warning, warming, sorry, ozone, acidification potential, and, and everything that has to do with, uh, with water, by the way, here, and the rest is human health. What's interesting, 
And these are numbers we can all extract. If you go from the reference mix that was the, you know, the 40 MP, and then you decide to go for the one at 35, uh, you see a reduction of impact or improvement of about 8%. If you go to the next mix, uh, then you have, uh, with nowhere, nowhere entrainment, another improvement. And so all mix, if you go from that 40 MP to that 35 MP, that's not a big surprise, by the way, but just to see the amount of improvement in terms of environmental impact, the average on these, you know, the different indicators, the, and you can see they're all about more or less the same. The average improvement here is between 8, 9.5%. So if we were able, and that's the, and the hypothesis here, if the monitoring system can help us instead of going for a 40 MP, instead of over-engineering up to 40 MP, just over-engineer it to 35, there's a very significant impact. This is huge, this is big. I mean, we're trying to change a little bit of silica fume, fly ash, slag to reduce the impact here and there. This, tomorrow morning, almost directly available because you don't over-engineer it. And we've seen it, we've heard it today. So I think it's, it's an impact that we cannot neglect. The other question we decided to ask ourselves, say, what's, how does it compare? Let's say you take a mix, regular 40 MPA mix design, that's the one down there, oops, no more here, and uh, you put uh, slag in there, fly ash, sorry, 15% fly ash in your 40 MPA, what's the impact of doing this? The impact is a reduction or an improvement on the environmental impact on average of 9.5%. Well, we just run the other number. Using the same mix but not over engineering it, going at 35 MP instead of 40 is roughly the same impact. So it's, it's, it's just a rough, rough comparison to say, well, using a monitoring system is almost the equivalent as using or replacing cement with 15% fly ash. Well, it sounds pretty impressive as far as I'm concerned. It's a direct impact of being able to do a better job when it's time to engineer our mix design. So I'm, I'm glad we heard that before today because it really, really shows that there's a lot to do there. Uh, so that's what I had to show you. A little bit of discussion here. Uh, there's clearly a very significant impact in terms of dollar figures, and depending how much the system costs, of course, but at a dollar a yard, if you start looking at how many yards a year a concrete plant or even a concrete company will, will, will be able to do, uh, that, that's a huge, huge economy there. The environmental analysis, uh, if, if using a monitoring system, gives us two very important things. I mean, the potential gain uh, on not over-engineering our mix design is, is close to 10%. I mean, the number to remember is between 8 and 10%. And the potential benefit is comparable to using 15% flash. And I thought that's a number. I want you to walk away with that kind of numbers in mind, that it, it really has an, an interesting impact. Now, we have to see how we're going to do this, how we're going to use it not to over-engineer our mix. But from what we've seen today, I think we're not 25 years away from it. We're just a few months to be able to really implement that and make sure it's, it's, it's working. Uh, the prospect, well, obviously for this project, uh, it's, it's, we need to, and that's a huge thing, we need to continue digging in that database. It's only one database for one concrete producer. We could do a lot more with the data we have. It's a rough analysis. I mean, it's a master's project. We only have a few months to work on this. I think we need to go further. We need to find experts that will help us dig in those databases. There's a lot, lot to do there. Plus, we're, what we're working on also, because it's, it's a, it's a five-year project with six or seven grad students, uh, we're looking at calibration process. We had discussion or questions about calibration process. What's really amazing with the, the, the monitoring system and the, the, the in-the-drum probe thing is that you can actually measure all kinds of slumps on all kinds of concrete. We can measure slump on SCC, we can measure slump on relatively dry concrete. Although anything between two inches is probably anyway too dry to deal with, so it's not a big deal if you're not exactly precise there. But being able to pre measure and, and uh, predict slump on an SCC mix is, is really interesting. We have, right now we're following a job site where they're running like, how many trucks a day out there? Xavier, how many trucks from uh, the, the SCC mix you were, you were you're following? I mean, there was like, where every day we're, we're, we're getting uh, dozens of trucks very quickly, so it's, it's, it's quite impressive. Okay, it's very Iceland. Okay. Slump, so. Close enough. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, we're, we're also working on segregation, uh, detecting end of mixing, detecting segregation, long halt, if temperature changes, if you're going for a long distance, how do you deal with that? We're looking at measuring rheology, full rheology measurement with the, with the ready mix truck. That's also very interesting where you try to predict pumpability, predict placement. Uh, we see more and more pumping on job sites everywhere. Volume measurement, then he uh, talked about it, and, uh, and many other potential improvements. Thank you very much.
that's what I have for you. Mark, you mentioned uh, oh, uh, that you think the time savings on the waiting to, to discharge is from them accepting it and not testing it. Isn't it more likely that that time saving is from the contractor who wants to add water and wet it up? He now can see the slump, so he knows how much water to add. So Could, add yeah, what, that, the time? That's a really interesting thing. We have no idea, actually. We looked at it without even knowing what was going on there. We know that, that before 2018, when there were no pro, a lot of drivers were asked to log in a lot, a lot of things, so we, we know there's a, some of the standard deviations that are used, but yeah, that could be it. Uh, I just want to touch on one thing that, that Mark uh, talked about. Uh, you, you think about how often we're supposed to test our concrete trucks, right? And so even on DOT jobs and things like that, and it's, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but one in five or something like that, in terms of, this is every truck that's measured. Either of these systems. Every time. single truck is measured. Right? And so that's something that, that's really, it's not 20% of your trucks. It's every single one. And that's something to kind of internalize from this, uh, this mm -hmm. session. Come on, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. And everyone who presented here, this is really advanced stuff. It's very interesting. Quick question about uh, measurement of rheology. I assume that you're referring to plastic viscosity yes. in addition to yield stress. Uh, could you tell us a little bit uh, what, what is involved in that measurement and what is the comparison to what rheometer and what do you think the shear rate would be during the... We're, we're barely starting working on this. I mean, okay. Denny did some measurement in the past and it, it worked well using, I assume it was using the IBB rheometer, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, we're, we're starting to work on this. We have data. We, the, the interesting thing with the, a, a, the internal probe system is you, I mean, we looked at, I, said, I already said we have a lot of data. But plus, you can go and take a look at what happens in only one turn. You can, you can get a lot more information when it starts entering concrete, going down, coming back up, and things like that. But short answer, yes, yield and plastic viscosity. Uh, mostly, most probably compared to our I, regular IBB rheometer because we're not looking at fundamental data or fundamental uh, properties. We're looking at just being able to predict things like pumping, placement, and, 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 uh, so and, and such. Because pumping and placement, I mean, pumping the shear rates are so, so much higher than yep. what happens inside the truck. Yep. And we have to be careful. Oh, yeah, of course. Be, but the idea is to try to, try to go a little bit further than the slump. I mean, we're, yeah, yeah. you know, you, 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 we all have started our, visco our rheology papers the same way. A slump is great, but it's not enough anymore. So we're trying to get the, you know, rheology 2.0 on the job site, get a little bit more information. And, and, <coughs> Bringing a rheometer on job site is a nice idea, but it doesn't work very often, so we need, we need to go a step further. Maybe we should refer that question to Dr. Valdez, because he's done a lot of analysis on the shear rate inside of the rhythmic truck, so maybe he can comment on this. Yes, I can comment. We have been working on several aspects of this. We have made numerical simulation and verified that also with a practical test. The problem is the rate of shear will be so extreme variable depending on uh, how much volume you have filled in the truck uh, and the drum speed. We have also published in Cement and Concrete Research uh, equation telling how, what will be the rate of shear. The next paper which will come is actually to connect it to the uh, torque so you can it would be very good if we could connect uh, these probes or these tests to the viscosity. Mm -hmm. But I think we are still far away. So I this is answer the question without answering. As long as we're getting closer. <laughs> as long as we're getting closer, closer, that's what we need to do, right?